Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're back in Chicago at the People's Summit. One of the things we're interested here at the summit and afterwards, a lot of people are running for office who never even considered running for office before. Certainly something uh, Bernie Sanders has been calling on people to do. And a year ago at the People's Summit, it was sort of the big conclusion of the summit that lots of people should run for office at all kinds of levels. So over the next little while, we're going to be interviewing and talking to people who have made a decision or are exploring a decision to run for office. Now joining me here at, in our studio at the summit is Richard Dean Winfield. He's a philosophy, philosophy professor at the University of Georgia. He's exploring running for Congress in Georgia's 10th congressional district. He's running on a progressive platform that includes a federal job guarantee with a $20 an hour minimum wage, something called legal care based on the model of single payer health care, which I guess means everyone actually can afford and get a lawyer. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Thank you. So first of all, you're running in a very conservative, relatively conservative state in yes. a conservative district. Yes. Um, are you running with any chance to win or you're running to have, sort of affect some public mm -hmm. opinion? Well, I, I'm, I'm attempting to and do I mean, both. Let me say, I mean, yes. you're not running yet. You're exploring yes. running. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, my interest in this is to, to is to raise issues that I feel no other candidates have put forward, that have not really yet been discussed at the People's Summit, that are that are crucial parts of a new social bill of rights that we need in order to really realize the promise of the American dream and eliminate the deficits in, in social freedom and the dangers to democracy that we face, and a key platform of this new social bill of rights is recognition and enforcement of the true right to work. That is the right of all willing and able adult residents to have a full-time job at a living wage. And uh, by a living wage, I mean something that will support them and their dependents. And I think it's realistic to speak about a $20 minimum wage with full uh, um, inflation and productivity adjustments. So you have to do this through public sector hiring? This would be through public sector hiring, through public works, that would address the kind of uh, public works that serve the, the, the public good, such as working for a green in energy infrastructure, taking care of all the public services that have in many respects been gutted by recent policies, providing all the kind of robot-proof care that people need, uh, thinking of things like mass transit, and thinking about doing all the kind of also cultural activities that would that would allow now, free now, access to people. Now to but, guarantee a job at 20 bucks an hour uh, is like it's essentially proposing a dagger into the heart of capitalism. I, I, because yeah. capitalism depends on a certain level of unemployment. That one of the roles of the Fed is to make sure there's a, 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 at least a three, four, five percent uh, employment rate, and even higher when yeah. you look at. A lack of participation. Well, look, I, th I think that that's, it, it may be true that, that private enterprises, owing to the very structure of competition, are continually having to redo their productive process to develop uh, more efficient means of, of operations, produce new products and development. But that doesn't mean that we leave the people who are thrown aside in the lurch with no means of becoming, of remaining independently, uh, economically independent and secure. So this is not something that is going to prevent businesses from being able to expand and draw upon a new labor force. In fact, if you put everyone to work, you're going to increase consumer demand. And, I'm, I'm not and I think it's not going to be. It, but I'm saying it, it's not something that will, it, it, will be a threat to capitalism. If create, well, if you create a, a, a floor of wages, which yeah. Yeah. essentially is 20 yeah. bucks an hour, yeah. it's going to create a big push on wages across the board, which is an enormous, uh, at least the way. Yeah. Big corporations well, yeah. see it a big threat to their profitability. Well, in a sense, that's not entirely true because the, the growing inequality in the United States is directly tied to economic stagnation and the decline in our overall growth rate of the GNP, which is partly due to the fact that the share of national income that has gone to wages has become smaller than ever before. And that means that at the highest reaches of uh, individuals who have the most wealth, they're sitting on huge amounts of capital that are not being productively invested. Whereas if we do raise wages, we would allow much more of the accumulated wealth to be in the hands of those who will have to spend most of it. And we're talking about a wage level that is actually equivalent to what the minimum wage was in 1960. It was $1.60 an hour. If you adjust that for inflation and productivity gains, 
it comes to over $21 per hour. Keep in mind that since 1973, wages have no longer risen in conjunction with productivity increases. There's been a stagnation in wages, whereas from 1945 until 73, there was a steady in-step march of both, which allowed uh, the standard of living of most people to rise. So how do you so pay we, for this, is the obvious? You're gonna get that, that ask no. that over and over. Well, let's say we have about 10, let's say we, we have 10% of the workforce, which is about 160 million people, and we think of them being employed at $20 an hour, and this would be the maximum amount in a great recession. Um, we're talking about each getting $41,600 per year as their salary. That would come to $666 billion. If you think of the overhead costs that the government projects during the New Deal had, they had about an overhead of about a third of the cost of what the uh, wage expenditures were. We're talking about something that's still less than a trillion dollars. Our national income is over $18 trillion. Our national wealth is over $90 trillion. We're talking about a very small fraction. And remember, we can subtract from the expenditures all the money is going into unemployment insurance and all the other social services that the jobless are, are faced with. And then you have to think about, we, we're, we're going to be building with this expenditure assets for the public good that will benefit economic activity in general. So this is not something that is that is utopian. It's something that's practical. Remember, during the New Deal, when our population was about 125 million people, when our level of production was something like 6% of what it is today, in the greatest economic crisis in our history, they were able to put over 8 million people to work and yeah, build some the, of the greatest The other proposal, uh, yeah. your platform is legal care. What yes, is that? Yes, yes. Um, look, none of our rights are really safe unless everyone has access, equal access, to legal representation to uphold their rights. Our Constitution does guarantee people representation for criminal cases, but civil cases are just as important because the wrongs in civil cases are no different from the wrongs in, in criminal cases. It's just a matter of them being uh, perpetrated without malicious intent. And if you think about the way in which criminal legal care is afforded people in our society, it, it's clearly underfunded by and large, if one thinks about public defenders who have huge caseloads, don't have the resources for proper investigations. Court-appointed lawyers may not make their point appointment appointed duty the real focus of their activities. Why not instead allow individuals not only to have representation in criminal cases, but also in civil cases with any lawyer they want so that people don't have to undergo the indignity of being stigmatized by a means test. Instead, we set up a system just well, like so single-payer health care. Times, actually, yeah. uh, I guess or maybe it was the New York Magazine. Yes. Uh, just did a recent expose on a real estate company, yeah. actually owned by Jared Kushner. Yes. And in Baltimore, where we're headquartered, or yes. just outside, where housing, pro there's this uh, low-income housing yeah. privately owned by Kushner's company. Yeah. And they're constantly taking people to court over the most minor infractions. Even sometimes people who have paid their rent sure. are getting dragged into court and foreclosed, and they can't afford lawyers. And think of all and the they depend yeah. on yeah. the fact that people yeah. can't afford lawyers. And think of all the people who are stuck in jail because they're not able to pay various fees of all sorts. So I think this is, this is so, again, a game how do you changing finance thing. That? I think all of these measures should be financed by highly graduated wealth taxes, and if they have to be supplemented by highly graduated income taxes. And I think the wealth tax can cannot um, suffer the problem of producing a capital flight by being a tax on worldwide assets of people residing in the United States. And I think it's, it's perfectly feasible to do this. The amount of accumulated wealth is the greatest in human history. It's five times the level of our national income. And that is where the greatest inequalities reside by far. Okay, well, if you decide to run, we'll, yes. we'll follow and see how you do. Okay. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.